Hi everyone, and welcome back to the first section of the 16th module of the History of Christianity 1 course. In the previous few modules, we have mostly concentrated on the Church in Western Europe. The expansion of the Church to the East into Asia and to the South into Africa had dramatically slowed because of the Islamic invasions. But in God's providence, the expansion of the Church was not ultimately limited or stalled. In this section, we'll examine how Europe began to explore and discover other places outside of the control of Islam, and how the Church began to expand to those places. This is the history of the conquest of the New World and the Church's part in this era of history. And it is the exploration and trade with Africa and the Far East in this era of history. In this section, we'll concentrate almost exclusively on the activities of the Spanish and Portuguese for reasons we'll examine in a minute. But first, let's place these events in the timeline. Around the same time as the events we covered in the last section, the Portuguese had been exploring the west coast of Africa for a large part of the 1400s AD. In 1488, they sailed around Africa's southern cape into the Indian Ocean for the first time. Christopher Columbus's four voyages to the New World took place from 1492 to 1504. In 1498, Vasco da Gama reached India by going around Africa. And in 1500, Cabral discovered Brazil for Portugal. Cortes conquered much of Mexico from 1518 to 1521 AD, and Pizarro conquered the Incan Empire in Peru from 1531 to 1532. Francis Xavier did missionary work in the Far East from 1542 to 1552, and he first reached and evangelized in Japan in 1549. And Mateo Riki arrived in China in 1582 AD. These events are at the very end of, and in some cases after the time, technically covered by this course. And they are at a key point of transition in world history in many different ways, most of which will be covered in the History of Christianity 2 course. And that leads to the first of a few disclaimers I need to make, so that there's no misunderstanding about what this section covers. Because of the nature of this course, covering the Church until the dawn of the Protestant Reformation, this course, and therefore this section, will only cover a very short beginning period of larger events and trends which lasted long after the scope of this course, and this section will concentrate on the activities of the Spanish and the Portuguese. The Dutch, French, English, and others were also involved in exploration and the expansion of the Church, but their contributions were a bit later in time, after the scope of this course. And so, in this section, you'll not get the whole story, but only the introductory chapter. And therefore, I advise you against making broad conclusions about the entire story based only on the first chapter. God has brought some amazing things out of these events, even though some of these events were not all that godly. Try to think big picture, even though we'll only cover a small part of the picture. Second, these events can be tricky to understand because there are a few distinct movements happening at the same time. There were people exploring for the purpose of trade and in search of riches, which sometimes involved military conquest, and the Church tried to take advantage of those discoveries of unreached peoples to reach them with the Gospel and expand the Church. In some ways, the Church and its Gospel mission was distinct from the trade and conquest. But in some ways, they were necessarily linked. If we lump all these purposes and actions together, will misunderstand these events. But if we completely separate the Church from the traders and explorers, we'll also not accurately understand these times either. Those who did the trade and conquest claimed to be Christian, but not all of their actions were Christ-like or done for godly motives. So we can ask, when they behaved badly, were they demonstrating the Christian faith or betraying it? Were they acting as consistent Christians or were they suppressing their Christian ideals and acting like humanity always acts without Christ? So, there were people exploring new places for selfish reasons, and there were people going to new places for the sake of Christ. 
and it's sometimes difficult to separate the different motives and actions. Now, let's talk about the reason that all of this exploration took place at this time. Yes, there were explorers before this time, and there is good evidence that the Vikings reached North America before Columbus. But why did exploration explode in that era? Part of the reason was that they were making better ships, and they had better maps and navigation technology that made these kind of voyages much more possible. And part of the reason was that this was a time of relative prosperity, and therefore there were rulers who were willing to front the cost of these voyages. But one of the main reasons for this exploration was in order to avoid Islam. The Muslim lands were between Europe and the desired trade in the East, and their mistreatment of travelers made trade by easterly routes impossible. So people wanted to get to the East for trade, but needed to go around Islam to do it. And one of the pioneers of this exploration, named Henry the Navigator, wanted to make allies with sub-Saharan Africa, some of whom converted to Christ, in order to stall Islam's advance in Africa. And finally, the success of some of the first voyages increased the willingness for more people to finance and or make later voyages. Now, let's get into the actual history of this exploration and expansion. Like I mentioned, we'll concentrate only on the Spanish and the Portuguese. And in order to kind of keep in chronological order, we'll switch back and forth between the Spanish and the Portuguese, and we'll go back and forth from Africa to the Western Hemisphere and back to India and the Far East. So, fasten your seatbelts. It started with Africa. The exploration of the west coast of Africa was begun by the Portuguese. Henry the Navigator, who was the brother of the Portuguese king, had fought in wars to recover territory in northern Africa from the Muslims, and from that, he learned stories of other parts of the continent and the products of trade to be found there. And he also learned that much of Africa was not Muslim and could be gained as allies against them. He did some exploring himself, but he mostly gathered and trained others and sent them out. So Portuguese sailors explored further and further south along the west coast of Africa. They initiated trading posts and trading relationships at various places along the coast. The original intent was to trade for gold along what became called the Gold Coast, but the trade eventually included African slaves, and that was the beginning of the European slave trade. Now, by the way, the slave trade had been going in Africa long before the Europeans arrived, and continues in some places even today. The Portuguese had reached as far as modern Sierra Leone at the time of Henry's death, but the exploration continued after him, and in 1488 they reached the southern tip of Africa, and the exploration continued around to the east coast. In the various places they traded, eventually churches and mission schools arose. They were started for the benefit of the European traders, but included outreach to the native Africans, many of whom were converted. And then there were ministry training schools. So eventually, some African kings were converted and their people with them. And there were native African bishops leading their people in some places. Shortly after this time, Spain began its exploration. But instead of going south to Africa, they went west. The Spanish exploration was started by Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Now, Columbus was actually Italian, but he was working for the Spanish. The scholars of Europe already knew that the earth was round long before Columbus. They just underestimated how large the earth was. So, Columbus wanted to find and prove a westerly route to the Far East. But he wrote that he was also earnestly desirous of taking Christianity to heathen lands. His three ships first found land in present-day Bahamas in 1492. He found native tribes living there and wrote in his diary that he wanted to convert them to our holy faith by love rather than by force. Columbus made a total of four trips 
exploring much of the Caribbean. On returning to Europe, records of his voyage let the rest of the world know of the existence of new lands to the west. And it was eventually confirmed that these were previously unknown continents and not the Far East, as Columbus had thought. Queen Isabella of Spain decreed that the freedom of the natives must be respected. She required that Europeans could only use natives as plantation laborers if the natives did this voluntarily, if they were paid well enough to support their families, if they were not made to work hazardous jobs, and if they were given Christian instruction. That was the ideal, but her instructions were often ignored in practice. And so, Spain continued to send explorers to the New World to continue where Columbus left off. And some set up plantations to raise crops and usually used the natives as laborers on their plantations. Like I mentioned, there were well-intentioned rules to protect the natives, but Spain was a long ways away and the rules were rarely followed. However, most of the early explorers were looking for gold and they found a lot of it, usually through conquest. Hernando Cortes conquered an already existing Aztec empire in Mexico. In 1523, Cortes ordered that landowners must make provision for Christian instruction for those who worked their land and to forbid them from worshiping idols. Following the explorers and their conquests, missionaries, usually monastics, set up missions throughout Mexico, including what is now the Southwest United States and South Central America. These missions saw large-scale conversions and baptisms because the natives were convinced that the god of the Europeans was greater than their pagan gods. But there was much slower progress in catechism and Christian life among the natives, and there was much unchristian behavior among the Spanish. There were regular complaints that the clergy were ignorant, uneducated, and or corrupt. But many of the clergy were godly, and they often stood up for the rights of the natives against Spanish oppression. And similar things happened throughout Central and South America, just on a smaller scale than the conquest of the Aztecs. And in South America, Francisco Pizarro discovered and conquered the Incan Empire, which covered a huge territory in western South America. Likewise, this was followed by missionaries who saw large-scale conversions and baptisms and much slower progress in catechism and Christian life and culture development. The Spanish sometimes oppressed, sometimes befriended many smaller tribes in other places, and missionaries were part of the continuing presence of Europeans in each place, with varied success. And in South America, oftentimes the missionaries were the first Europeans to go to many places, where they set up stations to teach the natives not only the Christian faith, but also agriculture, industrial, and other skills. And the Portuguese also explored and conquered in eastern South America, in what is modern-day Brazil. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI had divided which lands were open to Spain and which to Portugal, with a boundary in the Atlantic Ocean. He intended the New World to go to Spain and Africa to go to Portugal. However, the east coast of Brazil turned out that was on the Portuguese side of that line. In 1500, Pedro Cabral, intending to go to India around the south of Africa, he just went too far west on his way around Africa, and he sighted the coast of Brazil. So Portugal took advantage of this and set up plantations in Brazil. They used native slaves and slaves bought from African and Arab slave traders in Africa, and there was some mission work among the natives and slaves on the plantations in Brazil, similar to what was happening in the Spanish-controlled lands. Now, while all that was happening in the Western Hemisphere, Portugal was continuing to explore the Indian Ocean on the far side of Africa. In 1498, Vasco da Gama reached India and its trade markets by going around Africa, and this completely bypassed the previous trade monopolies to the east, which were held by Venice and the Islamic Caliphates, 
So Western Europe had found a way to get to Eastern markets directly. And da Gama sold the cargo that he brought back on his first journey for 60 times the cost of the voyage. And that spectacular return on investment led many others to follow his example. And soon, there were Portuguese trading outposts in India and throughout the lands on the Indian Ocean. And eventually, priests and missionaries followed, to serve the European traders and their families, but also to evangelize the native peoples wherever there were opportunities. One of the most famous missionaries was Francis Xavier. He actually worked in a number of different places, in a number of different languages. He started in various Portuguese ports in India, teaching, preaching, and evangelizing. He trained and catechized, especially among the children. One of his strategies was to reach the children and, through them, reach their parents. And he also started colleges and invited more missionaries to continue his work in India. Then Xavier met some Japanese, and he traveled with them back to Japan. He evangelized there and was fairly successful. He wanted to reach all of Japan, but he strategized that the way to do so was to first win China, because at that time China was a significant cultural influence on Japan. So, Xavier made plans to evangelize in China. But China was very reluctant to allow foreigners into the country, and Xavier died waiting for an opportunity to enter China. There are two other later missionaries in this part of the world, which I briefly want to mention. The first is Roberto de Nobili. He worked in India. But he noticed that most of the Christian converts were among the lowest classes of the Indian caste system. And so this prevented Christianity from having a larger impact. So he purposely worked among the high caste Brahmins in India. He adapted many of their ways to reach them, hoping through them to reach all of Indian society. And he was fairly successful. But he was also accused of compromise and syncretism because he adapted Christianity to many of the Brahmin ways of thinking. And lastly is a man named Matteo Ricci. He was a missionary to China. Like I mentioned, China was very resistant to outsiders and their influence. Riki was well-educated in geography, mathematics, and astronomy, and he used his knowledge to win the respect of Chinese scholars, and they, in turn, recommended him to the emperor, who allowed him to move to the capital city and teach there. And he also taught Christianity to many of the high officials and scholars of the Chinese capital and he made some converts. He also was accused of compromising the faith too much with Chinese custom and ways of thinking. Now, whether de Nobili and Riki compromised too much with non-Christian thinking, or if they were faithful and strategic to communicate Christian truth in ways that made sense to other cultures, that's still debated today, and that's something every missionary in every generation needs to struggle with. How can we communicate Christ to this or that culture in a way that makes sense to their way of thinking, while at the same time challenging their way of thinking to conform to Christ without compromising Christian truth in the process? Now, that's a brief summary of some of the exploration and expansion that happened in this period, as well as how the church reached out to new places as a result of this exploration. But now I want to examine more closely, where was the church in all this? And as usual, history is complicated, and I'll need to oversimplify. But I hope we can get a general sense of what the church was doing and learn some lessons from that. Any answer to the question, what was the church doing, needs to be answered on two levels. We can look at the church at the level of the top of the hierarchy, the church leaders, And we can also look at the church at the lower levels, the priests, the monastics, and ordinary Christians living in those situations. At this time, the hierarchy of the church, like much of the European leadership, was fairly corrupt. But for the record, Ferdinand and Isabella stand out as relatively godly compared to the leaders in France and Italy at that time. And the church was allied with or controlled by the political powers. They were sometimes partners with the military powers in the exploration and the exploitation of the natives, 
but the church was also much less powerful than civil governments at that time. Church activity was usually under direct control of the crown and limited in what it could or could not do, especially in the colonies and trading posts. And therefore, sometimes the church leadership opposed the politics of exploitation, but could not do anything about it. In 1537, Pope Paul II issued a decree that natives are not dumb brutes and that they could understand the gospel and genuinely convert to Christ. And he argued that the natives should not be enslaved and should keep their freedom and their property. But of course, not everyone obeyed that decree. And some of the church leadership, especially in the New World, willingly participated in the exploitation of the natives and the subsequent wealth and power that came from that. And many others simply ignored the plight of the oppressed and did nothing to stop it. However, on the lower levels of the hierarchy, the local priests and monastics were much more beneficial to the natives in the various places where the church and European civilization expanded. They usually shared in the poverty and hardship of that life, and they often defended the natives and fought against their oppression. They preached the gospel and educated the natives, and they also spoke against and rescued natives from pagan religions and cultures that were often more oppressive and exploitative than the European plantations. Thus, they rescued them from religions with practices like human sacrifice and cannibalism. And many, like Bartolomé de las Casas and Domingo Salazar, advocated for the benefit of the natives and worked to change laws and attitudes for their protection. And people like Pedro Claver worked to evangelize and to improve the lot of Africans brought to the New World as slaves. So, if we're to be honest in our evaluation of the church in these events, we need to acknowledge both the good and the bad, because there were both. And that leads into the question of how we should respond to the accusation that the Europeans, including the church, brought genocide to the Western Hemisphere. Now, as Christians, we should be honest and own up to our mistakes, even when our history is not pretty. Yet at the same time, as Christians, we should care about the truth and defend it when it is attacked or twisted. So I want to attempt to do both of those things. This might sound a bit defensive and partial, but that's only an attempt to balance a lot of bad history and a lot of dishonest propaganda that gets most of the attention these days. I want to make sure you get the other side of the story from what is primarily taught in our culture these days. And I recommend you don't just take my word for it, but search it out and listen to both sides and examine the evidence before you make up your mind. First, we need to understand again that history is complicated and is often not pretty, and the impact on the natives in the New World and Africa was not pretty. There was much suffering brought to the natives. Some of it was unintentional. The majority of deaths were caused by diseases unintentionally brought by the explorers to which the natives had no immunity. That is, smallpox killed way more natives than the Europeans did. And there were also economic and social realities for which the natives were not prepared. However, some of it was intentional. The Europeans were militarily, technologically, and economically a lot stronger, and they used that advantage to take gold and to take slaves. There was economic oppression and exploitation, and Christians should be disgusted by it whenever it happened. And yet, the bad should never prevent us from also admitting the good. There was also much blessing brought to the natives as well, and we should be honest and admit, and admit that as well. Now, you might ask, what kind of blessing are you talking about? Well, I'll just summarize. Compare the before and after of education, economic opportunity, standard of living, medicine, and especially access to hearing the gospel of Christ and believing in Christ for eternal life. Again, those things sometimes came at great cost, but they can't be ignored either. And for our own understanding of these events, and especially when someone tries to twist the history of those events for political or ideological reasons, 
a very helpful question again is compared to what? How do these events compare to other times in history when a stronger group encountered a weaker group? How does this compare to Genghis Khan? How does this compare to the expansion of Islam? Were the Vikings as compassionate and peaceful when they invaded? How were the conquered peoples treated in those cases? Are we aware that vastly more African slaves went to the Middle East than went to the New World? And were arguably treated better in the New World? European conquerors, for the most part, allowed the natives to keep their own civilization and languages, etc. They did not kill off the natives or try to erase their cultures like some of the other historical conquests have done. Rather, they typically attempted to let them continue in their own customs and or integrate with the European ways as each would choose for themselves. And how did this compare to how other native tribes treated each other in war and conquest long before Columbus came around? Columbus was actually welcomed by one of the native tribes in Hispaniola because he treated them better than their neighboring tribe, who regularly enslaved and or killed and ate them. The Aztecs slaughtered thousands of people a year in ritual sacrifices to their gods, and Cortes was only able to conquer the Aztecs by enlisting the help of the other native tribes who were sick of being brutalized by them. And how does the European treatment of the natives compare to the treatment of the Europeans whenever they fell into the hand of the natives? Now, I could go on, but I don't want to belabor the point. It's all horrible. And please don't think I'm trying to excuse any of it. I'm just trying to help us think clearly and justly when we try to evaluate. Just because some of the explorers did some things wrong does not necessarily mean that everything every explorer did was wrong. And it does not necessarily mean that everything the natives did was therefore perfectly good either. And most importantly, just because someone in the past did something wrong does not in any way excuse us from our own wickedness and sin. Their wrongdoing does not necessarily make anyone else right. If we look down on them and assume we are better than them, we don't know our own hearts and we've ignored Jesus' words. History is complicated, and history was usually pretty brutal, because all humanity is fallen and brutal without Christ. In addition, we need to think clearly and sanely about what options they had in their own situation, and we should separate these concepts without letting our emotions or our ideology get in the way. I'll say it again. Some things that were done by the explorers in the church that followed them were sinful and wicked. But that does not make everything about the explorers or the church sinful and wicked. At their worst, they behave like all of humanity has always behaved, sinful, greedy, and selfish. We should not be surprised by that. But at the same time, we need to recognize that at their best, they did much better than the rest of humanity, the rest of history has done in similar situations. Many in the church stuck up for the people who could do them no good, and they did it at great personal cost only because it was the right thing to do and because it honored Christ. For instance, European Christians participated in slavery in the slave trade, but European Christians did not invent slavery. Far from it. Actually, more people were taken as slaves from Europe to Northern Africa than were taken as slaves from Africa to the United States. And European Christians are the ones who ended slavery, not just in Europe, but in most of the world. And they did it at great expense and sacrifice. And the only reason that anyone in the world today thinks slavery is wrong is because European Christians changed the world's mind based on biblical teaching. Now, the bottom line I'm trying to get to has nothing to do with these people being European versus being from any other part of the world or any other ethnicity. It's not about ethnicity at all. The point I'm making is that these people were Christians as opposed to any other worldview. And there's something about the Christian worldview that elevates people 
So when we look at all these things in the wider context of sinful humanity, it is evidence of God's grace that the Christians treated the natives so well compared to how people were treated in similar situations throughout history. Therefore, the actions of some of the explorers and their followers cannot legitimately be used as an argument against Christ. But if we honestly approach understanding these events in their own context and compared to how humanity has treated one another throughout history, it actually demonstrates that Christianity is better than the alternatives. So if someone wants to harp on how bad Western civilization has been, ask them about the track record of whatever alternative they're proposing. The people who try to genocide shame people of this era are typically ill-informed or even deceptive. And I hope you think twice before letting yourself be bamboozled by those arguments. And I suggest you ask some tough questions about whatever utopian scheme they're trying to replace it with. Again, I'm not trying to be partial, but I only want to bring some balance to this topic so that you can hear both sides before making up your own mind, hopefully based on the authority of Scripture and an accurate understanding of what actually happened in the real world and not in some utopian fantasy, so that we can be honest and accurate about the past, and so that we can do better in the future, and so that we won't fall for an ideology of envy that has proven in history to make everything worse, without exception. And now, let's review. In this era of exploration and expansion, the New World was discovered and conquered, new routes and trade with Africa and then with the Far East were opened, the Church reached people in each of these areas with various levels of success, but these were just the beginnings of later missionary activities. The Europeans brought both blessing to the natives and exploitation of the natives at different times and places. Part of the church was cooperating with the villains of the story, and part of the church were acting heroically in this story. And that brings us to some discussion and application questions. First, what did you learn about the explorers and traders in this era? Describe what they did and why they did it. What do you think was good about what they did and why? How can you learn from and imitate the good things you see from their story? And what do you think was bad about what they did and why? What can you learn from their mistakes? And what steps can you take to protect yourself from making similar kinds of mistakes? Describe how you think they could have done better, knowing what we now know from historical hindsight. And then is the same question about the church in that era. What did you learn about what the church was doing in the new places that became open because of the explorers? Why did the church do what it did in those places? What do you think was good and why? What principles and insights did you learn from the good things that they did? And how can you apply these things in your own life and ministry? And describe how you think the church did not live up to its calling or how it could have done better. What was bad and or inadequate about what it did? What principles and insights did you learn from the church's shortcomings? And how do these insights apply to your own life and ministry? Next, how should Christians, when they have power and opportunity, act toward vulnerable people? How can we help protect people from being exploited or harmed without exploiting them or disempowering them? How can we help the victimized without re-victimizing them or making them dependent? And how can we guard a biblical standard of justice and righteousness against the many false ideas of justice that are pervasive in our society? What have you learned from this material that would help you maximize your effort to help people, while also guarding against the possibility that what you intend to be helpful would actually be harmful in the long run? What lessons do you wish your local church and or the larger church would learn and apply to contemporary situations? And how can you personally pray, advocate, and act in order to make a positive difference while guarding your heart against self-righteousness? And finally, what else did you learn from this material that stood out to you? And how do you intend to put that insight into practice in your own life? 
So now feel free to pause for discussion. Take as much time as you need to work through these issues from this controversial period. And when you're ready, come back for the guiding principles. So pause the video now. And that brings us to some guiding principles. First, as Christians, we should always seek to uphold justice. We should try to protect the innocent and defeat the guilty. People's positions of power don't determine their eligibility for justice. We should try to help the oppressed even if they can't help us, even if they look different from us, even if they're not yet born. And that argument cuts both ways. If someone who is in the rich majority is innocent, then they deserve the protection of justice just as much as the poor outcast. And the Bible needs to be our functional standard of what is justice, rather than somebody on social media. Second, I think that exploration and expansion are good. All other things being equal, we should try to learn more and go farther. I think it could glorify God to probe space and travel to Mars or even farther. But at the same time, we should count the cost. We should never explore and expand at the expense of our virtue or at the expense of other people. We should never expand our influence by unjustly limiting someone else's. However, we don't need to see all of life as a zero-sum game. Let the listener understand. And I think going out in order to spread the gospel is always extra special good. Spreading Christian culture and its blessings is always good. At the same time, we should recognize that a Christian-influenced culture is not a guarantee against evil. We should not assume that we're good just because we live in a culture where Christ is proclaimed. We should acknowledge the potential for wickedness in our own heart and life. We should not just assume we would have done better than those historical people when we've not faced their same temptations. We're all selfish and have blind spots, and we're all potential Hitlers except for the grace of God. Therefore, be careful how hard you look down on the mistakes of others only because you lack their opportunity. And no matter what kinds of situations we're in, we should use the opportunity to proclaim Christ and to serve people, even if it's not the best of situations. Now, I'm sure that many of the church people back in those times clearly knew how bad things were, and in many cases, they were not able to change those things. But they did what they could to make the best in a bad situation. They comforted and served the slaves and natives. They told the slaves and natives about Jesus, even if they could not yet free them from their slavery. They did what they could. And the flip side of that is that we shouldn't dehumanize and exploit the people we're trying to help. Now, of course, that means don't enslave them or rip them off. But I'm not just talking about the the obvious con artists who claim they're going to help people, but who actually then just pocket the donations and don't actually do anything. Those people are evil, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the attitude that people who try to help others are tempted to adapt. The attitude that degrades people or treats them as infants. Oh, those poor, helpless so-and-so people. They are so much less smart and privileged than I am. They can't do anything for themselves unless I swoop in and save them, because they're like children who need me to baby them. Do you see how insulting and dehumanizing that kind of attitude can be? And you're nobody's savior. So we all need to guard against that kind of poison attitude. Don't exploit or look down upon the people you're trying to serve. Don't dehumanize them, but rather treat them as viable agents created in God's image. Give them what they need to help themselves, but be absolutely disgusted with anything that would make them dependent on you or on other people instead of being dependent on God and taking responsibility for their own future. And finally, as I said in a previous section, don't give in to ideological shaming 
that is historically ignorant. For the most part, ignore it. But if people are being swayed and hurt by it, speak up with the truth. Now, like I said at the beginning, we've covered just the smallest sliver of the history of the church in the New World, in Africa, and in the Far East. But that's all we're able to cover in the limitations of this course. However, I hope this has given you a taste of the good things that happened so that you see the possibility for more good things to happen. And I hope you've seen some of the mistakes of the past so that you can work to avoid repeating them. And I pray that God works in your heart so that you would catch the same spirit of adventure and boldness that you would risk great things for his glory, but that you would also be wise and do no harm, and to keep Christian character in your dealings with all kinds of people wherever you go. In the next and final section of this course, we'll review and wrap up what we've seen in this course and try to bring it all to a conclusion that helps you to step out and make history. Thanks for watching.